This is the first part of a three-part series on pulse oximetry. This part will focus on how pulse oximetry works, including the accuracy of the measurements. I have nothing to disclose. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Actual oxygen saturation is defined as the oxyhemoglobin concentration divided by the sum of all forms of hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin, deoxygenated hemoglobin, methemoglobin, and carboxyhemoglobin, plus any other aberrant hemoglobin forms. In contrast, pulse oximetry, also sometimes described as functional saturation, is oxyhemoglobin saturation divided by the sum of the oxyhemoglobin and deoxygenated, also known as reduced hemoglobin. In most circumstances, this is a clinically relevant number since the other forms of hemoglobin are present in very low concentrations. Obviously, the number becomes less relevant under circumstances where the concentration of another form of hemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin, for example, is high. Conventional pulse oximetry involves two light-emitting diodes, one of which emits light in the red band and the other of which emits light in the infrared band. Oxyhemoglobin absorbs less red light than reduced hemoglobin. You know this because arterial blood, which has a higher partial pressure of oxygen, is brighter red than venous blood. On the other hand, oxyhemoglobin absorbs more infrared light than reduced hemoglobin. Based on the differential absorptions of light, it is possible to estimate the amount of oxyhemoglobin and reduced hemoglobin, which in turn allows calculation of the approximate percentage of hemoglobin that is oxygenated, or the functional saturation. If you have viewed any of my prior video casts, you know I have repeatedly said I am not an artist. Here's one more proof of that. In any event, the illustration shows the probe gray around a finger. The probe's two LEDs are represented by the red and purple blobs, which are supposed to indicate the red and infrared LEDs respectively. The sensor, yellow, is also evident. This is an attempt to show the red and infrared light being emitted by the LEDs. Now think about the tissues the light must traverse to go from the LEDs to the sensor. The bulk of the tissue is cartilage, muscle, and bone of the finger. In addition, the pulse oximeter has to distinguish arterial blood from venous blood and capillary blood. The process can be viewed as consisting of an element of constant absorption, illustrated here by the blue box, and an element of variable absorption, consisting of the changes in absorption due to expansion of the arterial vessels associated with an arterial pulsation. This illustration adds the element of arterial blood, as represented by the red line overlying the finger. It shows that compared to the infrared light, less of the red light is absorbed as it transits the tissues. In contrast, this illustration adds the element of deoxygenated blood, as represented by the blue line overlying the finger. It shows that more of the red light is absorbed compared to the amount of infrared light that is absorbed. Effectively what happens is that the pulse oximeter only looks at the red over infrared ratio for the pulsatile component of the signal. One of the advantages of this is that each patient acts as his or her own control. This is important because it eliminates differences in baseline light absorption between individuals. Although the wavelengths of the transmitted light are not changed, the intensity of the light is adjusted. There must be enough light transmitted to result in a reasonable signal, but it cannot be such that it overwhelms the sensor. So how accurate are the values reported by the pulse oximeters? This graph demonstrates the relationship between the saturation, as measured by a pulse oximeter, and the value for arterial oxygen saturation determined from an arterial blood gas. Note that the range studied is fairly narrow, from 93% to 98%. I have added a red horizontal line, 
which indicates the times when the two values are identical. The green dashed line indicates the mean difference. Based on the way the calculation was performed, if the value for the saturation as reported by the pulse oximeter exceeded the value reported on the blood gas, the difference would be negative. The graph shows that the mean difference is slightly positive, that is, the values for saturation on the arterial blood gas are slightly higher, less than one half of one percent, than the values reported on the pulse oximeter. Obviously, if the pulse oximeter is to be used to indicate a problem, you would not want the pulse oximeter value to be higher than the actual saturation. As indicated by the blue box, you can see that essentially all of the values reported for SpO2 were within about 2% of the values reported from the blood gas. This is consistent with studies which have demonstrated that the SpO2 is within 5% of the value of arterial oxygen saturation measured by a co-oximeter. This relationship holds true for values of saturation between 70 and 100%. This slide demonstrates the difference between precision and bias. When referring to pulse oximetry, bias is the value of arterial oxygen saturation minus the saturation reported by the pulse oximeter. Precision is the standard deviation of the bias. Keeping in mind that the red horizontal line indicates the times when the two values were identical, from this slide, it should be evident that the pulse oximeter has relatively little bias, that is, the difference between the mean values is small. In addition, the pulse oximeter was fairly precise. The blue box shows the bounds of plus or minus 2% compared to the values measured on the arterial blood gas. It's evident that values reported by the pulse oximeter were almost all within 2% of the value determined from the AVG. It must be kept in mind, however, that all of these values range between 93 and 98%. The issue with the accuracy of pulse oximetry occurs at saturations of less than 70%. Because calibration curves developed for pulse oximeters were performed on healthy volunteers, low saturations weren't obtained. Another area of concern relates to the accuracy of the emission of light from the transmitter. Because the intended wavelength of light to detect deoxygenated hemoglobin is within 10% of the wavelength at which absorption is maximally steep, a slight change in the wavelength emitted may have a disproportionate effect on the value reported for saturation by the pulse oximeter. The case can be made, however, that neither of these factors are likely to have an impact on patient management. With regard to the low saturations, for example, would you do something different if the patient's saturation was 50% as opposed to 70%? Now consider the response time. As would be predicted, the greater the distance between the heart and the measurement location, the slower the response time. In summary, pulse oximeters report functional saturation. Conventional two-wavelength pulse oximeters are capable of detecting only oxygenated hemoglobin and reduced hemoglobin. Because the light must traverse all the tissues in the finger, the determination is based on a small percentage of the emitted light. Detecting arterial oxygenation relies on detecting phasic changes in the saturation, which the machine attributes to the arterial pulse. And finally, with saturations greater than 70%, pulse oximetry tends to slightly underestimate the actual saturation, but is routinely within about 2% of values measured on arterial blood gases. That's the end of the first part of pulse oximetry. I hope you found it useful. More material will be covered in parts two and three.